Hi, my name is Dennis Sullivan and I'm a local historian. I'm going to talk today about Oxford in its industrial heyday. Uh, most people are only familiar with the earliest history of the furnace, and so I'm going to pick it up in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, just after the last shippings were involved with it. The furnace was leased in uh, the year 1831 to William Henry, who was a, an experienced iron maker. Uh, William Henry is noted for having introduced uh, a number of improvements in the furnace that led to increased output and efficiency, including a thing called a hot blast, in which he recirculated the heat from the oven back into itself by means of a bellows pump that was driven by a water wheel from out back to the stream. And uh, that raised the temperature considerably and got a much bigger yield of iron. Mm -hmm. Henry was a very forward thinking person and uh, noticed as he looked around him that the uh, trees in the area were being cut for not only charcoal to feed the furnace, but also cleared for land for farming and so on. And he envisioned a time in the not too distant future in which there would be a shortage of charcoal. And so Aware of the fact that there was anthracite coal available not too far away in Pennsylvania, uh, Henry negotiated for a piece of land up in uh, an area called Slocum Hollow. Uh, he had almost consummated the deal, uh, and uh, his, his major financial backer died. That left him without a contract for the time being, so he came back to uh, go back to Newark to find other financiers. On the way, he stopped back in, in Oxford and uh, met uh, his daughter and her husband, uh, Sullivan Scranton, one of the three Scranton brothers, uh, and spent some time with them. Now, the Scrantons were entrepreneurs. They were all in business together. And I think they recognized the possibility of a good business venture there because they made an offer to Henry to take over the operations of fairness from him. In return, they would finance the land uh, purchase in the area, which later turned out, by the way, to be Scranton, Pennsylvania. It's an area rich in iron ore as well as anthracite coal, which are the, the major components are necessary, really, from, you know, from a mineral standpoint, to make iron. So, the Scrantons took over the furnace. And with their initially uh, their plan to uh, help support an, a growing railroad industry uh, by producing rails and car wheels here in the United States, because those things had to be imported from England in the early 19th century and at great expense. The Scrantons, in fact, did just that. The car wheel factory still exists, and it's across the street from the um, remains of the old Oxford furnace. It's a building that has kind of rounded looking door, a stone building, and that is where the Scrantons initially set up their um, their uh, wheel, car wheel factory. Now, they had also considered making nails at that time, and nails were cut iron. They were square looking nails that people were familiar with uh, 19th century construction or colonial construction, uh, would be able to recognize with four sided nail that had a slightly tapering on the square top. Those were made from plates of iron that were cut specifically for that by machines. The Scrantons wanted very much to get into the business, but the demand for rails from the growing railroad industry really kept them so busy that they weren't able to do it. Meantime, what they did was they got into the railroad business themselves. Uh, they cobbled together a whole bunch of very small uh, rail lines, privately owned ones, that were used to haul coal and uh, iron ore around in northern Pennsylvania, in um, uh, the Scranton area, actually, southern Pennsylvania, here in south, southeastern. And so, by doing that, they gradually built up a network uh, that went on to become the uh, Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad system. Now, that itself, and the whole other story, had about as much uh, effect on the history of industrial Oxford as the discovery of iron ore had. That, that's something to get into in a little day. Uh, by being able to bring out a continuous supply of anthracite, they were able to establish a business here at the uh, furnace that 
would never run out of either ore or a fuel to uh, smelt it. So, we go on to now the 1850s and 60s and the Scrattons were busily at work until the early, about 1870 or so, and they incorporated the Oxford Nail Company, finally, got into the nail business, and were promptly wiped out by the depression that uh, ravaged the, the entire country during the 1870s. In fact, it hit the Scrantons so badly that in order to keep the furnace running, they had to sell more and more of their interest in it to outside investors. It's, it's it's highly for them as a family business that they kept things operating and weren't able to, to lay, did not have to lay anybody off actually, and kept the furnace in operation during all that time. However, by the end of the Depression, the Scrantons had sold out so much of their own interest that they had lost control completely to investors who also then controlled the railroad. People like John Blair, in fact, of Blairstown. These people were different in their approach to business. They were not a family group, as it were. Uh, they were the archetypical 19th century business entrepreneurs. They were hard nosed, they were profit oriented, and they ran the businesses that way. So, the Scrantons were pushed out of the business completely by them, except for one son who was retained as the general manager for the works, and he left a short time afterwards. That was William Scranton. So now we have a reincorporation of the company as the Oxford Iron and Nail Company. And the Oxford Iron and Nail Company was immediately uh, on an expansive program. The uh, original furnace was blown out in 1884. And blown out means actually uh, put to sleep. It was out of production and it was replaced by a huge furnace that is located elsewhere. In fact, its um, former site is uh, now the um, Oxford Mosquito Control Commission grounds off of, uh, of um, Mine Hill Road. So, the Scrantons, um, I'm sorry, the um, new owners, I, I, I think, um, actually um, built a smelter, a rolling mill, a cast, uh, a, a keg mill, a stone factory, and a number of other businesses around. And it was what we would call an industry of vertically organized uh, company. Everything but everything, except coal that was coming in from Pennsylvania was uh, either dug up, processed, or manufactured right here in Oxford. Uh, those of us who are, uh, I'd say, archaeologically minded and probably see some of the artifacts that remain of that particular business, uh, you may notice as you walk around the streets in Oxford that across the grass there are pathways that look just as great to be natural pathways. They were part of a network of rail lines that the new company um, had established in order to get the ore from the mines to the ovens, to the smelter, and then off to the rolling mill and the nail factory. So you had a whole spider web of, of rail lines, some of which ran right next to houses, one of which ran practically on top of the Methodist church. There pictures of it showing, uh, showing how close the tracks in fact were to the church building. Um, people's houses rattled, uh, they were engulfed in steam, smoke, fumes, what have you. I mentioned the ovens also because part of the process of melting iron was to roast the ore first in order to drive off the sulfur. That made a, more brittle, a less brittle iron, a stronger, uh, more durable product. So the ore would be put in these giant shells and roasted very high temperatures and off the top would come a smoke that was really sulfur dioxide. If you've ever been in a high school chemistry class, you know what that stuff that smells like rotten eggs. Superheated, the gas would go up into the atmosphere combined with the moisture and it would produce a dilute rain of sulfuric acid. Uh, if you look at pictures of 
the surrounding area at the time looked kind of like a lunar landscape because all the vegetation around it was killed. That was um, also part of what people in Oxford were breathing. There is a picture, in fact, at that time, from the um, land behind Southern Scranton's house, South the Hill, overlooking Oxford, and it shows a smoky haze covering the entire industrial area. And uh, that's the, the haze that was causing people to have watery eyes and congestion in Oxford. It's said that uh, children used to play games around those ovens, uh, and a popular game was to stand close, close as you could. Uh, the winner was uh, who could do it first without gagging. Um, so, as we get into now the development of Oxford industrially, I mentioned that it was the typical 19th century business model. And this is what I would like to talk about next, because Labor Day is coming, and I think it needs um, to be set in, in the context of uh, why we have a Labor Day, for example. And uh, for that, I'd like to talk a little bit about what conditions were like here in Oxford for working people. We're fortunate that uh, the minister of the Oxford Presbyterian Church, Reverend Young, was a local historian also. And the church bulletins from the 1930s and 40s contain a huge amount of material about Oxford by people who 40 and 50 years before actually worked here for the iron company. They talk about things like the company store and they talk about the management style and so on. So it's, um, if you have an opportunity to see copies of those bulletins, uh, they open a window on what the 19th century labor conditions were like here in Oxford. For example, you may be surprised to know that the average laborer made $1 a day for a 12-hour day, six days a week, $6 for 72 hours. And uh, the immigrants who did this work mostly um, were first from the northern and uh, western parts of Europe, from England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Germany, Scandinavia. But after the 1870s, the Depression worldwide had caused a number of uh, things to change in the labor market. And so in Europe, suddenly the um, immigration shifted from northwestern Europe to Eastern and Southern Europe. The people coming, uh, coming in then as immigrants became, uh, were Slavs, Hungarians, Poles, and so on. Uh, this caused in Oxford uh, some consternation among the people who by that time considered themselves to be real Americans. Um, 